Good morning. If everybody will make sure that you scan for your attendance. Thank you for joining us this morning for uh, our GCTE meeting. Uh, just need to have some feedback from anybody who's online to make sure that you can hear us. Yep, I can hear you. Anybody in the chat? Okay. Um, also, I wanted to find out if Crystal Smith was online. Do you see that? I'm here. Yes. Can you hear me now? Okay. Thank you. All right. So, Lynn, if you want to start us off. Good morning, everyone. Um, so, first, I need to make sure we have a quorum. And I believe we do. And Crystal on the line and us. Is that right? Yes. yes. Okay. And then we need to approve the minutes from June 1st. Can I have a motion? Okay. Anybody second? Okay, thank you. Is Karen Hurst here today? Okay, you need to come up front, please. <laughs> um, just to make sure everybody can hear you um, about all your good work, and you know the people at home can also hear. Okay, so our first report is Liz. Oh, introduction of new members. Is anybody here for the first time or here again for the first time? Jaina. So, so Jaina Carnes um, is with us again. She was here at a level, what, three. Now she's back at North Fulton and went from short hair to long hair. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, glad to see you. Anybody else? Okay, welcome Jasmine, new PI nurse at Grady Byrne. Good morning, thank you. So welcome Tammy, and I'm glad you said that because we just emailed this week and I now can put the face with the name. Thank you. Anybody else? Effingham, would you repeat your name? I'm hard of hearing. <laughs> okay, Charton? Charlie, okay. So Alpha Bravo Charlie, okay. <laughs> Well, welcome. Okay, so uh, Marie, um, you or April, if you'd like to step up to the podium. Good morning, everyone. Thanks. Marie Propes with the Office of EMS and Trauma. I'm the State Trauma Registrar. And uh, for the report for the OTCPE and OBCPEs, um, we're still waiting on five more centers to submit their quarterly fourth quarter report. So um, once we have that, then we can tally up our percentages of the successful record closure rate and trauma surgeon arrival time rates that were reported. Um, the fiscal year 2024 forms are going to be updated and they will open September 15th. So you can begin completing those and they will be due October 15th. Um, the burn form is the one that is undergoing the most changes. So uh, to accommodate the burn centers and help that form to be more useful for them in their, their quarterly reviews. That's all I have. And I think we need to recognize Marie and April, and I guess Michael, they get little gold stars because they probably attend more surveys in the last three or four months than um, any of us have ever sat through. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. April has been on the road a lot. To yeah. Um, so happy to be here again. Uh, for those of you that have not met me, um, you will be here in the future. Um, so I have been with the Office of EMS and Trauma now since January. Um, as far as Renee Morgan's replacement as the Trauma Program Coordinator for the state, uh, we are still looking for that final candidate 
Um, we have very high hopes that we're going to get the right person in that position that can, you know, work with us and stay with us long term and do great things for our trauma system. Um, as far as our updates, um, most of you that have been with me know what my updates are. Uh, we had lots of ACS visits, um, initial verifications and re-verifications in the last several months. Um, I'm happy to say that they have all gone extremely well. Um, we also have quite a few ACS consultative visits coming up um, in the next several months as well as into the beginning of 2024. Um, we will be attending those with y'all. Those are, you know, just so we can be a part of and support your team. Um, for those that know, you know, that have had me there with you, um, we're just happy to be along to learn more about your program, learn where your struggles are, how can we, you know, help you. Uh, so don't be, you know, intimidated by our office being um, at your visit. Uh, we also have quite a few new trauma um, centers planning to come on board. Uh, currently, we have five um, level fours that will be coming on. We have a level three that will be joining us. And we also have a level two um, that's planning a survey, a state designation in February of 2024. So lots of growth happening. Um, hopefully, we'll get all of the new centers on within the next year, year and a half. Um, I have given some new centers certain people's contacts, so if you uh, if you get a phone call from them, um, please help encourage them in any way, teach them anything that you know. Um, they, you know, are, a lot of these newer level four centers are starting from scratch, so um, get your support and your help for them, uh, mentoring them would be super helpful. Um, the Office of EMS, I think the only update that we had, Kelly couldn't be here, but uh, the armband project is still going. It's still in its pilot phase. Um, and I think we're still working on how to get that data out. Um, but the, the armband number is in your registries now. Um, we are able to pull and see how many are missing. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to get that out of pilot phase um, soon and get it expanded into, I think the goal is to get it within the region and then expand it through the entire state. Um, I don't think I have anything else. Um, Marie covered the data. As far as your OT OTCPEs for quarter four, y'all bear with me. This, uh, this meeting here this week has um, delayed my review of your reports, but I will get to them this weekend, I promise. <laughs> and just for those that are of you that are new, the OCTPE, you know, I just know that's my quarterly report. Yeah. That's the alphabet soup. So that's electronically online what you submit to the state just to say I'm still here, these are the things, answering all the questions. So usually the trauma program manager does that, and then it has to go in, um, be reviewed, and then it gets sent to the trauma medical director, and then they have to sign off on it. And this is just part of your uh, being a designated hospital. And then the armband report, um, project, can you give a small synopsis of that for those that might not be familiar with that? Yeah, sure. Um, so the the goal of the armband project was to help identify uh, crash victims who, you know, a lot of times we don't have an ID on them. We don't have a name and we have all these John Doe's. Y'all aren't able to identify them um, or link the PCRs to your medical records because they get identified later. Uh, so the idea is that um, any crash victim um, they get an armband placed. It's a unique ID number for each armband that is put on. They will come to your facility and any transferring you know, facilities. That number will stay with them through the entire time. Um, and then there's a place in your registry to actually put that uh, armband number. And once the patient's identified, obviously, and you're putting in the registry, then we can go back and we can link all those PCRs um, all of the pre-hospital data using that armband number. So in, encourage your facilities, your ERs, when, if, you know, when they get to you, um, when we're out of that pilot phase, don't cut those armbands off. You know, that's like the first thing we wanna do, but that's, uh, it's really how we're gonna identify the patient. Um, it's starting with the crash victims, um, but I think the hope would be that we could expand it entirely into trauma someday. Um, I know that there's some, probably gonna be some roadblocks with that, but um, 
I think it'll be a good way to pull all of those pre-hospital to hospital records together. Um, and again, we're in the pilot phases, so we'll see how it works as we expand. And, and the pilot is in the Athens region? Um, it is uh, or with Northeast who? Georgia okay. um, Health System. My mistake. Yep. Um, it's Lumpkin and uh, Gainesville okay. is doing the pilot. Okay. So. And as far as, you know, they're doing, it, it's going well, but... Um, now we have to pull the records and see what those records are looking like. Is it pulling the pieces together that we wanted it to? So. Anybody have any questions before I step down? No. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, Tracy. Liz, do you want to come up and give your report? Sorry, I had to step out. Your boss. Share that. Your yeah. boss. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Savannah. Sorry, it's so hot. It could be worse than St. Simon's. I know it's like a bathtub down on the river. But um, uh, glad to have you all here. It's always a great turnout. Um, just a couple of updates uh, for you all, and you'll hear this again later today at the commission meeting. But um, from the American College of Surgeons system consult that we have. Um, we've developed like a, a nice, I'm a big fan of the one pager, like a one page spreadsheet on all the 80 plus recommendations that we have to work on. And one of the biggest things uh, that we're doing in partnership with um, our colleagues at DPH Office of EMS and Trauma is uh, we've created a trauma system executive leadership committee, which uh, includes Dr. Ashley as the chair of the commission, myself. Uh, Michael Johnson, Director for Office of EMS and Trauma in April, uh, who you just heard of as the Systems of Care Deputy Director, so that, um, you know, we need to come together on a lot of these things that we know were confusing to the stakeholders. Um, the college wasn't very forgiving when they said, you know, y'all basically need to get with the national norms and have one lead agency. But if you remember from Apollo 13, when they were trying to land um, the spacecraft and they said, we got to make this, Fit with this using only this and they needed essentially to put the round peg in the square hole with nothing but duct tape you know we're going to turn what is a weakness in their eyes into a strength for us and we're going to show them that through dual leadership and we have probably one of the strongest funded programs in the country we're going to make this a strength so bear with us and we'll um, we'll share more of that with you uh, as that progresses I'm excited to say that several states across the country are replicating our readiness cost survey. So there'll be some data, there'll be a webinar coming out on TCAA um, about that. So we're really, uh, really excited to see what comes of that. Um, Dr. Ashley and myself uh, are working closely with the Georgia Hospital Association Center for Rural Health. In fact, Dr. Medeiros and I are going down uh, next week for their meeting to kind of talk about, um, you know, we had a lot of recommendations from rural on the rural side and we need to figure out even if not everybody wants to become designated we know that's not feasible but how do we create this non-designated participating piece for folks so that we can at least get education out there and the foundation has a grant that they're getting ramped up to get really active with education so we we feel like we can all uh, get in on that so uh, more to come on that um and then with this uh, development of the trauma System Executive Leadership Committee. We're developing through um, with our database uh, with both um, Office of EMS and Trauma, with Image Trend and Biospatial, as well as our ESO Central site. We're developing a system wide dashboard. So, and you're all here for GQIP, which will have a whole big lot to do about outcomes tomorrow. But what we don't have is tracking a real time system efficiency metrics, performance metrics. What's our system-wide over and under triage like? Those are things that are not tracked through GQIP or through TQIP. So we kind of need to look at that. Later this afternoon, I'll flash up a thing on the screen with the commission meeting that you'll see, um, you'll see some of uh, what we're kind of looking for at that. It's not done by any means, but it's a start. Um, our Stop the Bleed program, uh, a year ago, the commission voted to expand the distribution of the bleeding control kits to other public entities, education institutions, law enforcement and government agencies. 
we're on like what Gabby the third or fourth round of open of uh, applications for that so that's third so um, the current application period is still open so get with your RTAC coordinator if you know of other entities that want to potentially participate in that and um, we're looking at I'm sure you've all heard by now but um, the what we normally have our Chateau Alain in February, March 1st time frame, we had to push that back to May because there's so many conflicts with national spring meetings. So um, it'll probably be too quick to turn around and meet and Gina would probably uh, lose her mind if she had to prepare for another meeting within 90 days of that meeting. So we'll figure out what the meeting schedule will look like. We wanna get that out to you guys as soon as possible so that everybody knows where there's kind of an attendance mandatory piece, you know well in advance what you're requirements are for that. So I think that's it, Tracy, unless there's any okay. questions. So just to make sure I heard you right, so the spring meeting is probably going to be pushed back to May? It is, it is pushed back to May. We confirm okay. that date, yeah. Okay. It is May 22nd. Okay, so if we've, uh, well, never mind. 20, 20 is a Monday. 21st is going to be GQIP, and 22nd Wednesday will be Commission GCTE. Okay. Questions? Okay, thank you. Cheryl? Come tell us all wonderful things that are happening. Well, we do have some wonderful things happening. So yes. I, I just came up at the right time. <laughs> First, I want to um, follow up and give you all an update on SEED, which is the Continuing Education Instructors Database. As you know, it is online. Each of your facilities should have received login information so that you can access the database. If for some reason you have not gotten it, please check with your TPM. Um, if there are still some concerns, then please reach out to me and I can help you with that. What I need you to do um, when you access SEED is to look at your own personal information or that of others who are perhaps on your staff, because we found that there are a few discrepancies um, in the information and we want to make sure that we correct all of that as soon as possible. You will be hearing from our office if you are in the database and for some reason either your credential or your card, whatever is associated with the program you teach, um, if it has expired. Because we want to stay on top of this and keep current information in there. So we'll reach out to you if you have um, an expiration date that's coming up to just remind you we need your new information or if it has already expired will be looking to get updated information from you. Now, the last time I think we were on a call, I had mentioned that when we got the um, new information, we would not be asking for a copy of your card, but many of you suggested that it would be an idea if we got a copy of that to make sure that everyone is current. So we will be asking for that as well when we reach out. If you've looked at the database, also for each individual card, you'll see that many of them have a yellow, I'm not a yellow, an orange banner at the top. And in the orange banner, it includes some expiration dates. If your card does not have an orange banner, it's because you did not send in the expiration dates when you sent in your information. So again, that'll probably be something that we'll reach out to you for so that everyone's card can have that information. In order to reach me, you can give me a call at 404-394-2912 or Cheryl at GeorgiaTraumaFoundation.org. Cheryl is C-H-E-R-Y-L-E. Now for the really good information. <laughs> we, um, as you know, have a grant we were just awarded for the uh, Rural Continuing Education Program Initiative. That grant project is underway. Our first um, class will be conducted at the end of this month, and we have 15 courses scheduled all around the state 
um, from this month through the end of March next year. There are six TNCC courses, six ENPC courses, and three RTT DC courses. They cover from uh, the top of the state to the bottom of the state. All of your facilities, um, if you have a rural facility, um, will have received this information. So a rural hospital or a critical access hospital, your um, staff is eligible to participate in this program um, in which we handle all of the expenses associated with this program. Um, if you do not have the information at your facility and someone um, on your staff needs to take part in some of these courses, please reach out to me and we'll let you know what you need to do to apply for participation in the course. Tracy, looks like you have something. Um, is there a way you can send out the schedule of the courses and where they're gonna be um, to the trauma program managers or just to the distribution list so they can see? Because what's really um, exciting about this is these are all courses that are needed, but they're offered in rural locations. So these are uh, stamped counties that are rural and this gives your smaller or lower level, higher level, whatever, uh, lower level threes and fours an opportunity to get a few more nurses into a course mm -hmm. and not have to put the course on yourself. So That's some correct. sometimes and so all your money or all your expenses are covered except just getting that nurse there just getting them there and that's the the only expense associated with it so we're taking care of course fees books all of that meals you don't have to worry about and anything. you and you said tncc and what else ENPC, PC, enpc rttdc and then plans are later on to add atls yes um, which will be great because i think sometimes it's really hard to get your docs into an atls class um, when they're holding them at level ones or twos, sometimes they end up filling up their own courses. Mm -hmm. um, and we're, you know, just strategically looking down the line, trying to develop more instructors in the different kind of courses that we're going to be teaching. Mm -hmm. So look for that email if you could send that schedule. And also, if you could send um, the link to the instructor um, database. Sure. Uh, that would be great too. Just yeah. to kind of remind everybody, go look if you're in there, or if you have people who teach any of these courses, put them in there so we can, you know, they can help us teach elsewhere and in your own area, and that'll help keep them um, current and certified. Correct. And one of the reasons um, we put seed together is because we found out that um, with the execution of these courses, you had the same instructors who were going all across the state to teach and you're wearing those instructors out. And there are other qualified people around the state who could teach. So what SEED does is it allows you to access the database. Right now there are eight different um, programs listed in there. It allows you to access um, the database and look for instructors in the various programs with those instructors being closer to you. And you can pick from a variety of instructors instead of calling on the same people over and over and over again. That way more people get to participate in the program and you're not um, exhausting just a couple of different resources. I will just make mention, uh, Tracy, since you asked me about that, I will send you the list of courses. I will also send you a map showing where the courses are located. But just to give you an idea, of um, where some of the courses will be held. Um, Archbold, Upson, Wayne, Union, Crisp, uh, Clinch Memorial, Emanuel, so Fairview Park, all across the state uh, will be conducting these courses. And again, just for this first year, we're looking at the three courses mentioned, TNCC, ENPC, RTTDC. We will be adding additional courses. Um, every year, and it's primarily going to be based based on demand. So if you need something at your facility and you're a rural or a critical access hospital, then let us know and we'll see what we can do about uh, making sure that that program gets out to you. And as it relates to um, that particular um, grant project, the Rural Continuing Education Program Initiative, Karen Hust is actually going to be uh, coordinating a lot of those courses for us, or coordinating the courses for us. So uh, she's been a great asset, and we look forward to uh, continuing that work 
through her. And just one more thing I'll mention before I step down. We have a fundraiser that's coming up and we just want to make you all aware of that. We will be participating this year in Georgia Gives Day on Giving Tuesday. And many of you may be aware of Giving Tuesday, but if you're not, it's just a day that's set aside annually where you connect people with various nonprofits and Georgia Gives is the Georgia version of that. So different nonprofits around the state of Georgia will be reaching out to see if they can get donors to support their projects. And we'll let you know um, about the projects we're looking to fund throughout the state. And we're not necessarily just calling on the trauma community to donate. We want the trauma community to ask their friends or their family to donate as we work to advance the system here in Georgia. So it's just a peer to peer uh, fundraiser. Um, and Cheryl, just remind everybody, what is the purpose of the Trauma Foundation, Georgia Trauma Foundation? Sometimes it's people get confused when you say Georgia Trauma Commission, GCTE, which is the Georgia Committee for Trauma Excellence. Mm -hmm. And that's this group here. And then you've got the Georgia Trauma Foundation. Um, just give us a little rundown. We're really here just to support the trauma community overall. Uh, primarily, you would say our partnership is with the commission. We want to make sure that whatever projects they've got going on, in addition to what we're doing to, to uh, support the system, work in alignment. So uh, right in the, in the past, our focus has primarily been on education. We are continuing to build upon that, as you can see with the initiative I just mentioned. Uh, but we will focus heavily uh, more heavily on fundraising. So that way uh, we can fundraise to support our projects and the commission's projects, but we can also look to see what the needs are across the state and in the various uh, RTAC regions and see what we can do to help about, uh, help raise money for those projects as well. Thank you, Cheryl. And I wanna mm -hmm. congratulate you on, this is the second big grant uh, from the state and mm -hmm. it takes a lot of they're very prescriptive on what they ask for yes. a lot of paper to answer, you know, maybe 12 to 20 questions. Um, and so pulling all that together and then ongoing, you know, working with people at the state to make sure you meet their milestones and reporting requirements. Mm -hmm. And I really appreciate that and want to recognize your work with that. So well, thank you. Thank you, but I also say thank you to GCTE because you all have been very supportive uh, when it comes to getting the information together to put into the grant to get it over for consideration, as well as just supporting um, any efforts that we have going on. It's going to take partnerships like what we have um, to advance trauma here in the state. It'll be all of us working together because no individual organization can take care of everything on its own. So thanks to you all as well. Gina, you wanna come up and give us an update on GQIP? Another alphabet soup? So, and if you could just briefly tell us what GQIP is. <laughs> <laughs> oh. GQIP is the Georgia Quality Improvement Program, and it's the trauma collaborative for, for the state. So I'm going to be brief because most of y'all are going to get to listen to all of us all day tomorrow. Um, so uh, brief update, some of the big things, Arborometrics project, and I'm, I really wish I had some good news um, regarding that, but um, the short answer is um, delayed, um, not on our part, on Arborometrics. Part. Um, so we're looking like December um, for a kickoff there. And um, two work groups that we're trying to get started, um, Time to Definitive Care and um, VTE Prophylaxis. So um, I'm hoping Dr. Todd will talk a little bit about that tomorrow. So they're, they're kind of like slow going um, for that. We had sent out a survey um, looking for uh, group members, volunteers, and a couple of folks to lead those groups. Didn't get a whole lot of bites, um, especially for folks to lead those groups um, for that. So I'm sure um, Dr. Todd will rally the troops about that, but certainly understand, you know, we're, we've all got full plates these days um, for that. Um, so that's really um, what's going on. We've got, hopefully we'll have a great meeting tomorrow. I'm excited 
um, about that. So, um, so when you say a delay till December, do you mean as far as um, data output and kind of <clears throat> trying to show some metrics, some numbers? Yes. Well, we're, and they are still in the build. Okay. Um, process. So it's kind of taken longer than what they anticipated or. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think we're all seeing this um, that there's there's not enough workforce. Right. Um, and I think that's what we're feeling. We actually have um, a meeting with their leadership team um, at the end of the month to kind of get a feel um, mm -hmm. for that because we it was kind of like um, we're good, we're good, we're good, and then and then you know we got to kind of a key metric that we were supposed to be starting some user acceptance testing which was a big and we didn't hit that mark and then that's kind of when they let me know that like we, we weren't even anywhere near that mark so um from that standpoint so um and i i think that may be part of the issue but we'll see we're we'll, we'll should get more more information from them on on what's kind of the hold up but that's what i'm i'm getting um the feel for that you know that's just kind of the, the engineers for those kind of things are Scarce. Uh, are scarce, and I think that's what's holding up some of the build. So, okay. Thank you. All right. So we're going to our subcommittee report. So GCTE is actually a subcommittee of the Georgia Trauma Commission. And then these are sub subcommittees. <laughs> so the subcommittees, the working groups of this group, and we're gonna start off with Kendra Home and Education. Thank you. Um, so the education subcommittee um, has, we're putting the final touches on last year's projects that we were working on, including um, education for outlying facilities to help address some of the problems that we were seeing with um, time to transfer to definitive care and hoping also to address some of the AKI um, issues that we just have across the state. So we had put together some, some PowerPoints. Those have been sent to the GCTE leadership for feedback, and I've gotten a little bit of feedback from that. Um, we'll be sending it to the rest of the GCTE education subcommittee for uh, review and feedback and any final tweaks. Once that's complete, we'll then be sending it to the rest, to the, the trauma programs throughout the state so that hopefully you can use these as education for uh, your referring facilities. There is also a, a blank slide that's included in um, the slide deck so that centers can put specific information about hospitals, um, individual hospitals that they may be meeting with or speaking to that, you know, where you have maybe some consistent problems with prolonged time to transfer. So um, the hope is that it can be used not only with your referring facilities, but also with um, maybe even EMS, helping them to, um, you know, maybe decide if, if the decision is to take a patient to an outlying hospital and or maybe potentially going a little further out of the way to go to a trauma center, um, looking at really what the best decision is for that patient um, when you consider prolonged transfers to definitive care. So. That's our hope is that we can use that to to address these kind of issues that we know are happening across the state. And so and if I just can comment, mm -hmm. I apologize. I was it took me a while to get to that email, um, but I reviewed both of them last week or the week before. They're excellent. Great. They are really good and they're simplistic, but they're you know, it's it makes a point and it makes a punch where you need to on the key points. So my compliments to the Thank group you. in putting that together, because um, I've thought about using some of that material in some of my system meetings also. Good. So, Good. you know, just taking some snippets. So I'm going to be um, replicating your work, uh, not plagiarizing it. Well, no, that's, that's the purpose. The, the purpose is to be a, a tool for, for centers. So be on the lookout. It will be coming um, for more widespread distribution in the near future. Um, and then the plans that we're working on currently, um, we are very, very, very happy to be supporting Cheryl and the, and the Georgia Trauma Foundation and Karen 
in any way that we can with the ongoing education um, in the rural centers. Very excited that that's an option for the state, and I think it really fits um, a, a serious need for the for the state. Um, and then upcoming projects that we're going to be working on for the for the education subcommittee include um, developing a toolkit for new trauma program managers at both level three and level four centers and for the higher level centers, level one and level two centers. So um, if you are, we, we, we have um, work groups that are forming for that. So we're very excited, uh, really enthusiastic team. But I would really love to hear from the trauma program managers in these level three and level four centers, especially um, to help us to really define what you feel like you need. Um, it's easier for us to, to make a useful toolkit if we're putting the right tools in it. <laughs> so um, I would really value any input from uh, managers in level three and level four centers and even some of the um, non-designated centers across the state, uh, things that you think might be useful for you if you're thinking about becoming a trauma program. So please reach out to me. You can either see me in person here or um, maybe we can get my email added into the chat. It's kholm at augusta.edu. Um, so please feel free to email me if you'd like uh, to support that or like some input into that. And then the second program that we're going to be working on is, uh, again, focused on some of the rural non-trauma centers, developing um, some suggested education for bedside nurses, uh, what skills, what education, what classes we feel like are important to help um, the ER nurses in that first hour of trauma care, what they need to do to, to take the best care of trauma patients possible so that we can get them transferred um, for the higher level care. So upcoming goals. Thank you, Kendra. Thank you. I'm really excited about this TPM toolkit. We've all either been that new TPM that just doesn't know the depth of what you've got to do as far as standards and state participation, but also if you've got experience, but you've changed levels where you're working, you know, there's always a little bit something extra. So just having people explain things in a different way or give you some resources and examples of things that you can do, I think it'll be really helpful. It's scary going through uh, and trying to take this job in. It's just overwhelming looking at everything. It's kind of like filling out a PRQ or, you know, becoming uh, a parent for the first time. It's like you get this crying baby and there's no instructions, you know, it's like, what do I do? It's overwhelming. So I think this will be a good project and I encourage uh, anybody who wants to help um, we don't expect a lot of time, but everybody's got some nuggets that they can add, and I think that'll be a great addition to our library. Yep. Um, I'm Kelly Roker, and I am the chair of the pediatric subcommittee. And I'm from Children's Healthcare of Atlanta at Scottish Rite. Um, so we've been working on um, a big SIPA project, and SIPA is shock index pediatric adjusted, and we're hoping to use it as um, sort of a fifth vital sign. Um, we produced um, a one-page tip sheet that got approved, and we'll probably use that for um, statewide education. Um, CHO is going to be a test site to see how that education rolls out. And we're going to put um, our EPIC SIPA score into production in September once education's been completed. We're having a little bit of trouble um, establishing metrics to measure the effectiveness of SIPA. And because the project hasn't started yet, we um, definitely need to figure out what, um, what metrics we're going to use to measure the um, effectiveness of the utilization of the SIPA score. Um, Dr. Smith is going to do a SIPA lecture tomorrow, so you'll learn a lot more about that tomorrow. Um, in coordination with the education subcommittee who was looking at timely transfers, the pediatric subcommittee is looking at pediatric transfer rationale. Um, and also in collaboration with that subcommittee, we're going to see if we can create an um, interfacility 
interfacility transfer toolkit for pediatrics that we can distribute to the state. Um, I think STN has one that, ha that they approved, but it's kind of outdated, so we don't have to completely recreate the wheel. It was really, it was really good. It just needs to be updated. Um, we're also looking at whole blood transfusion. I know a lot of people have a lot of questions about when peds are going to start um, using that or when they can use that for peds. So um, there's, Cho is involved in a big study. It's a nationwide study, and Eggleston is going to be um, one of the pilot sites for that study, and it is about to roll out. So more to come on um, whole blood for peds in the state of Georgia. And then we are trying to stay as involved as we can, obviously, with um, pediatric readiness so that we can assist with education when it becomes appropriate. You don't happen to remember what standard number that is for the peds readiness um, in that in the no. book mm -hmm. as a standard? No, um, I can I can find it for you. Though. OK, so just kind of to tweak or remind you, we're always trying to address things that will help you in meeting the standards in the ACS book, the update. And, and as a reminder, we bought um, hard copies of the uh, standards book when it first came out in March, but there has been an update in December. So you wanna make sure you're using the most current um, version. So my paper one, I was using it and I couldn't find something and it just finally slapped me in the face. I need to go to an updated version. So I've got an older hard copy, but I've got a uh, electronic copy that I'm bookmarking as I go through it. Um, so that's something that you can download from the ACS resources website. So just make sure that you use that December uh, version. Thank you, Kelly. And I think that'll be interesting, the SIPA, which is the pediatric shock index. <laughs> Um, and in time, it might be something that gets added to the registry um, as we see um, what's going on. Because just like with time to definitive care for adults, you know, it's all about shock and timeliness, trauma. You know, when I try to explain to people in finance or in HR, I'm, they're saying, well, what is trauma? You know, nobody knows what trauma is. And so you have to go through the spiel, you know, about that. And it's kind of like, you want them taken care of quickly and by people who know how to address the issues. Yeah, and there's a couple of graphs on the tip sheet that just show how much more effective SIPA is um, in anticipating a, pa a pediatric patient going into shock than b both pulse and blood pressure. And right. it's hard to correlate both of those in peds and, you know, SIPA is just one number. So, you know, our, our biggest hope is to prevent um, an outside hospital from putting a kid in the back of an ambulance for a two hour transport w without blood if their SIPA score is high before they even leave. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Karen Hest with uh, the uh, PI subcommittee and uh, I'm from Piedmont Walton. And so we have also been working on decreasing time to definitive care. That seems to be a very important initiative pretty much across platforms here. And um, we've been looking at it from the standpoint of what can be done within the individual hospitals to um, decrease the time. So we've shared some audit tools, um, primarily geared towards the level threes and fours to um, help folks uh, identify where their opportunities for improvement are and have encouraged everyone to make sure that they're auditing those time stamps and finding uh, the quick wins as well as the uh, longer term projects. So we'll be doing some more work with that. We just started with that in um, March. Um, we're also looking at uh, the issues with uh, actual transferring from a, uh, to a higher level facility. Um, we are hoping to engage the ones and twos on the committee to assist us with their transfer center processes. Um, we're looking at creating some sort of a criteria. Um, it's uh, been in the literature uh, termed a red box criteria, where if the lower level trauma center calls and um, identifies that their critical trauma patient meets one of those red box criteria, that um, the, the typical workings of the transfer center are just bypassed to get that patient um, accepted and moved out more quickly. So 
Um, lots of work will be done on that. Um, we're also looking at aligning with the March Pause Initiative um, to help capture the pre-hospital providers as well. Um, as Kendra mentioned, we want to make sure that they get to the right facility as quickly as possible if um, we can avoid them going to a non-trauma center or a lower level if this patient really does tap into that high level red box criteria. Um, we're also, we also worked on um, and uh, drafted and completed a uh, level four tool that will be used uh, in place of an outcomes module for those folks that don't have access to the online reg registry. Um, to help them complete their PI processes and document um, the things that need to be documented. So once they do move to an online registry, they'll be able to seamlessly move into that um, outcomes module, uh, either the information that they've collected through their initial audits or, um, or you know, just keep it on paper and move into the online registry. Thank you, Karen. You've, um, I've been attending those meetings and there's really been some good discussion. Um, if you would you um, tell everybody what your email address is so in case somebody wants one of those tools and they didn't get it in the email that you sent uh, it's been in the last one or two weeks sure. um, they can contact you and then get those tools because like I said the level fours don't all have the PI outcomes module so this would be a way for you to keep up with your looking at your transfers out and then also um, looking at a way to just quickly look at some of the issues with transfers out. Sure, um, it's karen.hust, it's H-U-S like Sam, T like Tom, at piedmont.org. And for the um, fours, or even if you're a three and you don't have the outcomes module and you wanna use these tools, we were, we're having a dialogue about what, how do you want that? Do you want it like a virtual webinar? Do you want like a hybrid where we can have some in person or whatever? Cause I think learning how to do that is a whole, art form in and of itself. If you haven't taken the rural topic course, I think that's a really great course to do that. And something else you mentioned in your report about the red box criteria, also through the recommendations of the ACS, they mentioned, if some of you were there, you remember them talking about the rescue stop thing so that EMS wouldn't just like dump your patient and like peace out and then your patient has to go on. Um, and I know there's challenges associated with that, but I reached out to Jeff Kirby, who's the current COT, national COT chair, who's from Alabama, and they do the rescue stop thing in Alabama. And he got me connected with the folks who rolled that out in Alabama. So maybe potentially having them come here, figure out how do we like navigate some of those hot button you guys know, because you I know who runs your EMS, well, who runs your EMS agency. But anyway, um, how we can maybe get get that kind of integrated or at least do a pilot project or something like that. So anyway, much more sounds great. for the Sounds great. Thanks, Liz. Yeah, it's really exciting. So, and that's something we had looked at with the data, but that's where we've got a lot of missing data. So this is some of the things about Arbor metrics and trying to work that out so we can get, um, look at data and be more reliable. I think when our, we looked at it, we were looking at, um, was it Liz, three to five hour transfer times for patients? you know, which is far above that golden hour. And, you know, as um, a big uh, level one transfer center, I see patients, 40% of our 4, 000, over 4,000 patients a year, 40% are transferred into us. And we're seeing transfer times of anywhere from about an hour to seven hours, depending on where they are and getting that, you know, transport so there are a lot of things that play into that so we're all working at things to try to work together to try to push that number down and get them in quicker to the, the definitive care um so the registry kelly can't be with us today so i'm going to take a stab at this and please speak up robin if you'd like um robin wave your hand at everybody so there's vanna Robin Axlin, she's my trauma data coordinator. Um, she's all things data at um, Navicent. Uh, she does a great job. She works remotely. That's probably why she's still saying, because she doesn't work with me day to day. <laughs> but uh, no, we have a great team. And so I was not at the last registry 
um, committee meeting, and um, I'm just going to give an overview. Those those meetings, if you'll make sure you have those dates on your calendar, I think how many are scheduled a year? Four. They have continuing education units with it. So for any of your registrars that need those continuing ed units, that's a great way to get it. Um, and uh, they do um, ISS coding stuff. They go over def data dictionary definitions and they talk about other things, you know, um, you know, just sending information back and forth about like one uh, email string I saw was uh, Perry prosthetic fractures, which that always comes up every now and then, you know, when is it trauma, is it trauma, those kind of things, but it helps when you hear your colleagues talk about this stuff. But I think the primary thing that we've looked at and we were um, generously given some money from the Trauma Commission from uh, registry education um, that we want to start dispersing ideally by the end of this year, the beginning of 24 with an emphasis on required registrar courses. So um, like the AIS 15 or the um, um, ATS or who, you know, I think Pomfrey has a course on just overall registry, um, you know, understanding of the database for keeping data about trauma. Um, and it's, so our main goal right now is to create a process to facilitate and allow course funded registration. Our goal is to start doing that by 23. Um, the course funding may be prorated depending on the trauma center level. So our emphasis will be on the level threes and fours to give them like full funding for, you know, whatever course they take. Um, and then maybe the level ones and twos might have a, a prorated. Um, we've still got to iron out. There was a lot of discussion at the registry meeting about this. Um, but we want to try to make our dollars go as far as they can. Um, and then also allowing for the person, you know, let the center choose what is their priority as far as um, taking uh, what education they want to go to. So um, the 2015, what year did we say we're going live with that in? Okay, so starting with 2025 admissions, we have to use 2015 uh, coding. So until then, we're still on the 08. If you've had a recent, and you can go on the Triple AM website, and they'll tell you if you've had a course since, and they'll give you a date, you can just get an AIS 15 update, and it's, I think, a four-hour course. Um, and I think the primary differences in coding for 15 versus 8 is pelvic and explosion injuries. Is that right? Okay, so there's a few spine um, uh, also, but you know the the bulk and the meat of it is 08. It's just you got to go online and see what's available. I think uh, by May of this year they had filled all their courses for the year, all the way through December, and so they added on some courses, and I'm pretty sure those are probably already closed out. Um, so. Anyway, um, just be thinking about that for the TPMs. And the um, thing I want to emphasize is anybody who enters uh, information into the registry, anybody who's in the registry, report writing, anybody, and we'll see this in our education in a few minutes, should have some of this education, especially the trauma, you know, oversight course. Um, I, um, not that I'm thankful for a deficiency in my survey, but I did get one in SBIRT, but I did get a, a social worker with that deficiency, so whatever it takes. Um, but I'm actually gonna have my social worker take the registrar course because it's kind of a gentle view of everything we're collecting data about, what we're doing with the data. It's just a little bit of everything. And because I want that social worker in there, some with whether it's expert stuff or whether it's PTSD screening or barriers to discharge planning. And some of that is in different places. So that's something that everybody needs to look at and think about. The, draw, uh, the trauma commission money is to help people out, but we're not here to do all your education for you. So, you know, you've got to fight that battle at your individual um, places too, but I, I think it's an excellent course. I would even recommend physicians taking it. Uh, 
because it's just a great overview. Uh, you don't realize the depth of what is put in the registry and what you can get back out and the power of it until you kind of see what's going on with that. Um, Robin or anybody else who attended the registry, last registry committee, is there anything else you feel like we need to bring out? Okay. And then Crystal, injury prevention. I'm here. Is there a way I can share my screen? Can y'all hear me okay, Tracy? Yes. All right, yes. so we just wrapped up yesterday evening the uh, virtual Stop the Bleed Blitz. So definitely want to thank all of you that participated with that. I had a couple of you reach out and apologize that you weren't able to do a session because uh, you were perhaps doing uh, something else or you were perhaps doing an in-person Stop the Bleed event. Um, no, no need to apologize. You're still a part of the, the event, um, whether you're able to, to do a session or not, because we can't get people there without you being able to share uh, that course information with your community. So we just appreciate everybody doing that. You know, we're now actually doing three of these a year. Um, so you know, people are kind of getting on a cycle. And uh, so what we noticed this year was we keep actually kind of the back to school blitz keeps getting smaller in terms of the number of um, webinars we actually do, but the attendance still tends to be really good. So we had a, a 786 uh, post-course surveys that were submitted uh, with a 4.7 experience rating. Uh, everybody was very gracious and appreciative in their comments. Uh, just by comparison, you know, the same instructional cadre um, did a pretty good large in-person event uh, most recently. And certainly we see that you know, experience ratings do tend to bump up a little bit with the in-person and the hands-on, but I still think we do a lot um, uh, with getting our webinars across and our school systems and technical colleges were actually a little bit more proactive this year and making plans to get people checked off. In fact, you know, immediately after I finished last night, one of our school systems messaged me and said that they've already gotten everybody hands-on skills completed. So, um, appreciate everybody for their heavy lift with that. As you're reaching out and you're doing hands-on skills, one of the things that you know we like to be able to do is periodically share pictures of various events going on around the state. Uh, so if you're posting to your own social media, something you're doing would stop the bleed. If you could, um, and I'm sorry, I got the hashtag wrong, but um, if you would just hashtag um, stop the bleed Georgia there, in your postings, we'll be able to capture that. And so as we push out pictures, you know, whether it's in a report or, or something else coming up, we would be able to, to grab, you know, kind of a, a good collection from across the state. Um, just to kind of let you know, we are able to break down attendees by both region and county and even down to the school and school district. Um, so just cut, this is kind of a, a snapshot of who, attended this particular blitz. You know, last blitz, I think we had a whole lot of folks from region two. It kind of wanes again, because we're doing this, uh, you know, about three times a year now. A lot of schools are back to fully in-person delivery, but a, a lot of our school nurses appreciate the fact that we're, we're at least doing the didactic part and they're able to follow up with the hands-on skills. I know a lot of the Cobb County uh, school nurses have worked with Danielle and they're following up to do skills training for those folks that attended in Cobb County. So very excited about how proactive everybody was in preparing for this this year uh, with everything else we have going on. Lots of things coming up. Um, obviously next month is fall prevention month. And so our fall prevention uh, resource kit is actually out there. You can access it at www.preventtraumageorgia.org. You just basically go to the fall prevention um, drop down menu if you don't mind. Uh, I know that if you look at that page, we do still have some stuff back up from April. We do need to get that down, but the, uh, the fall prevention toolkit is there. We've got a lot of social media resources there. We realize anytime we're putting out these toolkits, if you need to, to take this content and make it your own, or you need to co-brand it or anything like that, 
you're more than welcome to do that. If you, um, on the main page, the uh, preventtraumagorgia.org uh, page, you actually can even see like our hypothermia messaging because that's coming up. I know it's hard to believe right now when you're in Savannah and you're heating to death, but you know, even that messaging is gonna need to get out in the near future. Another group that's been a little bit uh, more proactive this year than, than perhaps in the past in getting their messaging out um, is the National Injury Prevention Day folks. Their toolkit's already out. Um, so all of our trauma centers, if you would, I know this is something that TCAA really partners with the Injury Free Coalition and Safe Kids uh, to, to be able to push out. So um, be on the lookout for those resources, use them. You know, take advantage of these low cost things that are coming up. Now we're entering the fall period. So, and I don't mean falls and, and fall related injuries. I mean, falls in general, but we know as we enter September, there's a lot of um, events that are coming up that are gonna be near and dear to our heart, whether it's fall prevention month and fall prevention week, you know, suicide prevention and awareness month. Um, you know, we've got our team driving, um, safety week, a lot of things are coming up. So as we're putting things out, whether it's flyers for, for Stop the Bleed Blitzes or these webinars, remember they're all designed to be co-branded if you would like to do that, uh, because we very much depend on everybody kind of sharing the messaging with their communities uh, to be successful. Um, many of you have been working with Wellstar Kennestone, Danielle and Julie with their team on some upcoming team driving events. Uh, so just realize that we, those are going on. She's already reaching out to those entities that are um, going to be participating in the Lutzi Foundation events. Um, so if they reach out, just realize that they're doing us a huge favor by kind of being our conduit uh, to uh, that particular group. Um, just like all of us kind of have niches, my niches stop the bleed. They've definitely taken on the role and the mantle of, of being our champions and our intercessors with that group. So thank you uh, for that. Uh, before I move on, are there any questions? And if y'all can think of something we're not doing that we need to be doing, you know, please reach out. Um, as you all know, I'm still trying to look for somebody to take uh, the chair position. I really want to uh, thank Jana Carnes uh, for, for messing up my life in that regard. I'm just picking since you're there in the room. But, um, you know, I've actually been in this uh, chair position for quite a while, and it's definitely time to pass on the torch. So if there's anybody willing to take it up, um, I'd love to hear from you. I wanna really encourage um, some of you. Uh, we've got some really strong programs and a lot of it is just kind of organizing. I'm not belittling what Crystal has done. She's done a great job. But even if you had two people that work together to co-chair the injury prevention, she's got a very mean boss who gave her a goal this year of um, not doing the chair of the injury prevention. <laughs> Uh, so um, Crystal does a lot of great stuff, but she needs to move on to some other things. And so, again, I just encourage you, I probably will start uh, making phone calls in the next couple of months to encourage some of my friends to consider maybe having, you know, different staff help out and step up into this chair role. So thank you, Crystal. Okay, next we have a guest speaker. Um, most of us know her, Kim Cotterman. She's with LifeLink of Georgia, which is the Organ Procurement Organization, OPO, another little alphabet soup there. So um, yes, uh, Kim has a very long title, so I'll let her tell everybody what it is. And she's brought a um, uh, coworker with her um that is near and dear to my heart so morning everybody thank you tracy i appreciate always time on the agenda here i know you guys always have a really full uh, agenda and program but it's awesome to be here in person with everybody it was nice to spend some time with some folks last night um hello to everybody on the phone hopefully we'll see you in in may uh, again, my name is Kim Cotterman. if you haven't met me i'm the director of professional programs for lifelink so um, i help to oversee 
some of our initiatives that are broader than at your individual hospital. Everyone has a, a hospital development liaison. Hopefully you know that person. Um, but I coordinate some of our larger programs, including our work with the Trauma Commission. So um, really appreciate everybody being here. I, I want to throw in real quick on a personal note also. Um, I was sharing this last night. So some of you know I have a 21-year-old son who's very, very interested in trauma and has been for several years. So he is currently in the um, EMT program at Grady, finishing in a few weeks. He is loving it. He's super excited. So um, those of you from EMS world and from Grady, please keep an eye out for him. <laughs> um, so he, he's still in school, working on a nursing degree. Not Don't know where he's going to end up, but um, any tips or anything you can share on the way, we'd love that. Um, I also want to introduce my colleague, Chuck Massey. Chuck is our team lead from Middle Georgia. Do, do the wave. Tracy taught you how to wave this morning. <laughs> So Chuck's going to be joining me on this trauma journey. We're, we're teaming up to really try to um, solidify some of our processes in kind of the way that we track data, develop more consistency. We are at most of our level one and level twos, at least, we are involved in some way in topic and we report organ donation data in those meetings. Um, please know that is something that ACS is looking for. So we are happy to help you provide that. Uh, but what we've realized is that there's a bit of, of inconsistency uh, because there's a lot of people involved, for one. Um, the registry, I think a lot of the questions in there are a little unclear uh, on what, what data point they're really looking for. So we're looking to um, build some consistency in that, consistency in the way that we're reporting out, really looking for educational opportunities across the board with you guys. So uh, you'll see Chuck on, I know the invites, Najira, you mentioned that he was added to yours recently. I believe he's in the Grady group. So um, reach out to one of us. I think my email is at the end, or I can send that to you um, if there's a way that we can get involved in those as well. Um, <clears throat> I also wanted to mention real quick that we have a new partnership. There is a, a new center that is uh, called the Mason Center for Donation and Transplantation Education. It's a big grant through the Mason Trust, which funds a lot of uh, support for the donation and transplant community. Uh, it is based out of Mercer. Uh, Brian Childs, is the ethicist at Memorial, is the head of it, and we are going to be on their board. I'm throwing that out there because for those of you who are involved in rural outreach in particular, that is the primary focus um, of the center right now. And so we're looking for ways to partner with them to get more education about um, both donation and access to transplantation in the rural community. So if you see a chance to partner on that, uh, again, reach out to me. We'd love to, to share with you. Um, and, and so I'm just gonna share a couple really quick data slides and then I'm gonna have Jesse come up and talk about one of the collaborations that we did recently as well in, in the rest of this time. So I'm in charge of this, <laughs> we'll see how this goes. Okay, <clears throat> so real quick in terms of referrals, <clears throat> excuse me, this is our fiscal year, which ended on June 30th. And I just wanted to point this out because if y'all feel like you've been calling us a lot more, you have. If you feel like you've been entering a lot more registry data on referrals, you have. Um, we broadened our clinical triggers last fall in really the goal of trying to sort of cast that broadest net. We are seeing our organ donor population and really expand uh, a lot more kind of overdose and post anoxia injuries versus just a straight up uh, blunt head trauma. So uh, we want to really maximize on those opportunities. So 1,500 more phone calls on potentials. These are just the vented patients in the last year. A lot of phone calls and a lot of work for everybody. Um, but the exciting thing about that is it really capitalized um, into a lot more donation for us. We had a record year in organ donation. This is the same referrals kind of broken down by, by mechanism of injury. And so you can see about 11% um, of all of those referrals came out of trauma. So 837, again, these are the still vented patients, so not the cardiac arrest, the, not the, the DOAs either. Um, and then from those, these are the actual donation results. So the first one were phone calls for evaluation. These are ones that resulted in an organ donation. So I wanted to point out on the last slide, trauma represents 11% of all of the calls that we get for a potential donor, but 25% of all of the cases that go on to become organ donors. Uh, you guys are, are, of course, critical to what we do. Um, not surprisingly, donors from trauma tend to be younger with less comorbidity factors, uh, and so we are able to transplant more organs. Um, I, it, we, I've talked before about the data and how we count it, and again, that's something we're trying to be more consistent in. So please know that there are probably a few more that fall out of this. This is kind of our first pass at the data in terms of, of how we can um, categorize it based on the information we get from the referral center. Tracy and I have talked before, though, about 
you know, things, things that you guys talk about all the time, like, like a drowning, not really a trauma. Well, yeah, except if they hit their head on the boat on the way down. Uh, you know, sometimes we don't always catch those, and I know that you guys have all the same struggles. So um, know that we do our best, but for the most part, we are working with the individual, um, your liaison in the hospital is working probably with your registrar or your program manager to get um, a more accurate death list so we can get a really true representation of that trauma data. And then, sorry, no one can read this, right? <laughs> but I just wanted to give you a little bit of a visual from last fiscal year of our top donor hospitals. Um, many, many of these hospitals are represented in the room. Again, heavy presence from Grady uh, and Memorial. And I, I just wanted to point out that uh, Grady had 57 organ donors last year uh, at, at their hospital and Memorial had 44. Both these hospitals are on pace this calendar year to do 60 organ donors. Um, not a reflection of necessarily a increase in mortality or anything, but just in really good processes and working really closely to make sure we're getting those referrals and maximizing them. So thank you guys so much for everything that you do. Um, and this is, again, our, our Chuck and I's first pass at really trying to categorize the level one and level two trauma centers. So, um, you know, in the past, I've given you some reports similar to this. We're working on giving them to you individually by your liaison instead of in, in a big sheet here. But this is just our level one and level twos. Uh, you can see fiscal year 21, 22, and 23. Uh, what percentage of all of your donors came from your trauma population? So I think these were all shared um, and you guys can have access to them. But I'm going to give the last few minutes over to Jesse, who's going to talk about a really great collaboration that we had for a publication. <laughs> I'll invite you to the so podium. Me. All right, so yes, um, I think as Kim was talking, I was just thinking, you know, she kept saying the processes that we have, and I think that that's why this collaborative paper that we worked on with LifeLink is so important. The, um, the processes, because as the data shows, trauma has such an impact on our organ donation rates and everything in our state. So first, before I start, I would just advise you, if you are not involved in your uh, your system or your organization's donation committee, if you have one. <laughs> I know a lot of us have those. Um, I would just urge you to get involved as the trauma representative because you can do a lot. Um, and I think the work that we were able to do at Northeast Georgia kind of is a great example of that, of that. But I've also, you know, talked to Tracy at length. I know they do a lot of work with their um, OPO liaison, Chuck, as well. So um, basically, a couple years, well, it's been a, been a bit more than a couple. So probably back in like 2015, 2016, I remember doing mortality reviews and there were several cases where we were like, why was that patient not a, not a donor? And so we started asking some of these questions during our trauma uh, PI process. And so we kind of made it a standard that for every death, we were gonna say, okay, could they have potentially been a donor? And so we kind of just embedded that into our culture as we reviewed these cases. And then all kind of in parallel, we were working very closely with our hospital uh, development liaison, Tisha Campbell, who is excellent. Kim knows I love Tisha. We're, uh, we work very closely together, but we were really just noticing that we needed, we were seeing some spots where we needed some additional education. We knew that, you know, organ donation was supported at our organization, but we felt that we could really enhance that culture of, of donation. And so we did a lot of things there in the um, kind of the late uh, 2000s. 15, 16 area. Um, we started doing these journal clubs. Um, we started doing just specific education to different groups. Um, and as I mentioned, we have a donation advisory committee. And, and for the longest, I was a member of that committee. Now I'm actually the chair of that committee. But again, because it just marries really well what we do in trauma every day, marries really well with, with what our OPO um, friends are trying to accomplish. So anyway, we use that donation advisory committee to, to sort of help shift that culture in our organization. And so a few of the things that we did, um, let's see. Oh, <laughs> just kidding. Um, some of the things that we did and put into our paper, well, let me back up. So we actually wrote a paper with Kim and with Tisha, several of the folks on our team. We were like, we've done all this great work. And as a lot of you know, we were going for our level one uh, verification. And so research and publications was one of our, uh, we knew we had a gap there. So we are like, what's some of the great work that we've already done that we could capitalize on? So we worked with the, the team uh, with LifeLink and, and we actually wrote up a paper and it was accepted into the American, uh, to AACN, American Association of Critical Care Nurses. And so it was published recently and I've sent this to Tracy so she can share the whole article with you guys. Um, but we were able to highlight some of the work we did at our organization. And as I said, some of that was 
just to get the right people, physician engagement, administrative engagement in organ donation. Um, and so that was that was really key. Then we again, we noticed some gaps in education, uh, kind of donor or patient management. Um, and so we you know relied heavily on their team. They brought in some transplant surgeons, uh, different team members that could talk to our surgeons and critical care um, staff about how to better manage these donors so that we could um, capitalize on our processes more. So, um, and then again, just I think one thing that I, I think we all feel really um, proud of is that we put a lot of visibility around organ donation, uh, not just for our organization, but for our community. And I know a lot of you guys already have these donor flag poles that you raise the flag when, when you have a donor on site, but we didn't have that. And so um, we knew that that would be something really special for our staff and that, that would be something really special for the family of the donor. Uh, so we actually applied for a grant within our um, organization's foundation, and we were able to fund the flagpole. We, you know, now the flag is raised uh, when there is a donor case happening at our organization. Um, so that was a real, a real big win, I think, for that cultural shift. Um, and then we also implemented honor walks, and I know a lot of you guys do those as well. And that was, you know, that's just such a great thing for the staff, I think, to to just honor that family, but also to know that they impacted that care. And they, you know, although the outcome of that particular patient is not what we want, we are able to save lives um, because of all of our work together to, um, you know, to, to, to be able to procure the organs. Um, and then lastly, I think one thing we did right before COVID, right, Kim? Um, we did a donation remembrance celebration. And what we did is we invited all of the, um, donor families from like the past, I think, 18 months prior to this event. Um, we invited the families and then we literally went through all the charts and invited all the care team members from EMS all the way through the critical care units. We invited everybody. And so it was, I mean, I think there were three or 400 people at least at this event. We had a big dinner um, and it was just so great. We had a, um, a donor family member speak there. We had like a recipient family member speak there. And it was just a good time for us to honor, you know, we flashed the picture up, told a little bit about each of the donors. And so I think it was things like that that really just resonated with our, especially our hospital administration. Um, you know, there, it, it helps everybody remember the why. And so um, it's just, just a great example of, of um, collaboration that we did that I think that a lot of those things can be replicated if you're not already doing them. But I, I highly encourage, you know, just a really close relationship with your um, hospital development liaison and your trauma program. I think that's just, um, without a doubt, so important. And so uh, with that, I guess we could take any questions. Oh, sorry. Oh, well, and, and so we were able to show in the article that all of our interventions basically, you know, I'm sure there were some other contributing factors, but the interventions that we were able to do our data actually showed, um, you know, a promising trend. So we've got the data here from 2015 all the way through 2021. Um, and so, Kim, you may can speak to the data a little bit better, but the the organs transplanted obviously went up quite a bit during that time. And um, we've got the mark there for COVID because I think we all saw a slight reduction as we figured out what could we do? Could we actually um, still get organs from those patients? But any anything you want to add on the... Uh, no, I mean, I think the graph speaks for itself, really just exponential increase in, um, that's organs transplanted, which obviously comes from having a lot more donors. Um, just super support all across uh, the whole system, honestly, and from administration down. That event that, that Jesse was talking about was one of the coolest things that I've seen in my many years, just to have really from first responder all the way through administration, the family together, just really honoring those gifts. So anyway, we, we'd love to share the work. I think we're going to put a link out to the article. And again, here's our contact information. So mine and then again, Chuck, if, if you're able to add him um, to uh, the work groups, that'd be great. I think we're getting to all of those. Uh, but excited to have him on board. He is Tracy's work husband. So thank you for sharing him with us. <laughs> Yeah, I told my husband I was coming to this meeting without him because my hospital husband was going to be here. So <laughs> have to keep working home separated. But um, seriously, Chuck's been a great help to me. I'm very encouraged, Jesse. You've done a lot of great work, and I feel a little bit um, depressed <laughs> because I haven't done. But you've got some great ideas. So you know, we can't all think about this. So this is just almost like an organ procurement. Uh, toolkit almost is what your article is. And so um, 
if I send that to you, that article to you, Gabby, can you send that out with um, everything so everybody gets a copy of it? Because even if you just put one of these activities in here, it's a start to get things going. Um, and a lot of it is just keeping it to the level of consciousness for people. You know, it's a big deal for us because we see it more often. But um, I think Kim and I were talking last night. It really is sometimes hard for the bedside staff. They feel like they failed because this patient has died. But at the same time, you know, you do your best to have the best outcome, but some injuries are just not survivable and they're so catastrophic. And so, you know, when you can convert that to an organ donation, you know, that actually saves five, you know, four, five, six other lives and improves that quality. And so we really need to keep that in mind. So I do really encourage you, the um, stuff that we have in the registry or the data fields we have there are um, have unique uh, labels. They're not very intuitive, but you can use them. And I do encourage you to use them. Um, it didn't happen on this past survey, but the survey before I was asked, can you run me a list of patients who donated organs and what organs they donated? So, you know, that's not something that's in the PRQ, but you don't ever know when they're going to ask you that. So Chuck's always really good. We have DNV. I'm the point person for our hospital. I come running in and two on, you know, one leg like a cartoon and he's already texted me here are your numbers from last year and he sent me the latest stuff so I can put my hands on it. So they're here to support us and help us do better. Um, so I encourage you. That's a really great thing that you guys have done. So congratulations, Jesse. Thank you. And I would just say, I'm, my team always knows I say this all the time, but I'm always looking for a silver lining. And so back when I did all of our PI reviews, our mortality reviews, I mean, it kind of gets depressing, right? I mean, mm -hmm. and I know Laura uh, Wolf, our PI coordinator, sometimes I'm like, she calls it mortality row or death row that she's on as she's reviewing charts sometimes. But I think if we think about, you know, like you said, we have to have the processes in place to convert these patients to donors. And so that's why this relationship is so, so critical and then that is a silver lining it's not you know we're all here to save lives but you know in the silver lining is that we still get to even when the outcome of that patient is not is not what we want so i just encourage that um any way you can plug in at your organization with these lifelink folks they're amazing so Hearing please families at that ceremony I, I hated that we couldn't do it the next year because of covid but you know, to, to see how powerful donation is for them and the legacy that it leaves for the loved ones. Really nice. Well, and I think that's encouraging to the families because they've got that loss, but they know people remember them. And that's what they fear is that nobody's going to remember my brother or my mother or whoever it was that passed away. And, you know, we do value that sacrifice and, and the lives that they saved. So please do contact Kim or Chuck if you've got ideas or need some help or some suggestions. Um, Chuck's not gonna be able to hang around very long um, after the meeting because he's got to rush back to do new nurse orientation at my hospital. So, no <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, thank you for the presentation. That was really good. Yeah. Anybody have any questions or comments? And again, I can't say enough for the longstanding support of this committee to allow us to have a presence. It's not something that happens in most other states. Just the synergy, I think, of idea sharing has been really helpful for us. So I think there have been people who have reached out yeah, to people around the state of Georgia. So the OPO working with, you know, state organizations, you know, there's a very collaborative um, feel to everything. We work together. Just like I've always wanted us to have a t shirt that says we play in the sand together and that we could all wear that to TQIP one year. You know, uh, it's amazing when you go to these things how states don't, you know, it's so siloed and, you know, they're so competitive about they won't share stuff, you know, and we we're kind of more a little more basic and human. So we're all Georgia peaches that like to share. But um, that's true in the OPO world too. So somebody reached out, I think from Missouri, and I volunteered to go with Kim to Missouri because it's actually at University of Missouri or Mizzou where my daughter um, is now working. So, you know, if I can help you with that visit, I'd be glad to do it. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, what you Yeah.
Yeah. I'm still pushing for that T-shirt. Okay. Um, I think we've just got a standard review. And um, Gabby, if you could go to that slide. So I've got a couple of standards. My goal um, as uh, the chair this year is I'm going over a couple of standards each meeting. And so uh, you could look at it as the reason I want to do this is I want to use pink highlighters, you know, or shapes on slides. So I love pink, bright pink, because it's obnoxious. So, um, you know, I would use yellow, but sometimes, I, or maybe I should use DOT orange, I don't know. But, you know, just kind of break down some of the newer standards for you and, uh, you know, looking at it in a way. So, you know, the, um, I think the hardest thing to understand about trauma standards is, you know, the PIPs, which stands for performance improvement and patient safety. So that's what we're all after. And that is such a big portion of your um, survey. So when you look at it, you see applicable levels. So you see those looks like a lot of Roman numerals with L or PTC in front of it. Well, the L is for level. So level one trauma, level two, level threes. This standard applies to them. And for pediatric trauma centers, level one or level two, this standard applies for them. So, you know, excuse me for being very basic, but sometimes this hadn't been explained to people. And so I want to make sure I explain it. But definition, I love these new standards because they're very direct. But if you've not been in it a while, sometimes you don't have a lot of the background or the narrative to it, which the orange book did have a lot more narrative, but they weren't as clear as what do you expect to see. So they they say up front definition and requirement all trauma centers, the trauma PIPs program must be independent of the hospital or department departmental PI program, but it must report to the hospital or departmental. So in other words, your hospital quality department cannot do your PIPs program for you. And that has come up at surveys. Um, I think, you know, they don't like to see that because it is specialized. There are a lot of things they're asking you to look at. So you have to understand the trauma population. You have to understand the things that they're asking you to measure and you have to measure it. So you've got to have the staffing and you've got to have the knowledge about it. So you're the one, so it has to be within your trauma program administration or uh, department, however you want to uh, relate that. And also this kind of goes back a little bit. The PIPS program must be empowered to identify opportunities for improvement, OFI, and to function independently. So in other words, when you find something that isn't right, um, a patient as uh, Josie has a very great medical term, and she's the one who's always on mortality row, but when that patient crumps, in other words, they die, you know, but you see something that's, um, oh, we didn't catch this soon enough, you know, and so we've got to be empowered to say, okay, back up, and you know say we didn't do this we didn't identify sepsis soon enough you know or that the patient was going in to severe sepsis what can we do about it with our team or if there's somebody in another department um you know and have a way to address those issues so um i put down on the right um uh the other column i said remember so you've got to have you know those we've already been over these the TMD responsibility and authority and the TPM responsibility and authority. So the program has to be empowered to do this. Well, where does that come from? It comes from the trauma medical director and the trauma program manager. They've got to be empowered. So it's got to be in your job description. So they're looking, there's a lot of links between different standards. So you're going back and forth with this. So this is how you get it. And it's got, we've got to have a way to report these problems and for something to be done about it. Okay, so um, going down to measures of compliance. Um, let's see. So what they want to see is they want to see the hospital org chart that reflects the relationship of the PIPS program. So what you do in measuring everything and the organizational PI program demonstrating a bi-directional flow of information. Okay, that's simple enough. 
And so you show them an org chart. Are you through? No, because they're going to also look for in documentation from different cases. We see a mortality review where our patient was coded in a code blue, but the physician who ran the code really didn't follow ACS protocol. Well, that's really not on us, but we need to be able to report to our hospital quality or whoever it goes to in our hospital, you know, that can do something about that. If you've got a code blue committee or, you know, it depends on how your hospital is set up, but we need to be able to go back and say, you know, whoever was running this code didn't follow ACS. I mean, yeah, not ACS, um, a ACLS, another alphabet <laughs> suit. So confusing. So anyway, um, you know, so we've come across that instance. We've come across where um, sometimes we didn't have the supplies we needed. So they changed our, um, what do we call it, Josie, the chest tray? So open chest tray. So they changed the stuff on it, but we didn't realize it. And so they get it open and there's no scalpel. Okay, <laughs> so what do you do? You got somebody already dressed out, sterile, and you know, so it's kind of like going back and looking at these little things. So you have to go to who packs that tray? How can we get the scaffolds available? How can we make sure they're there? Make sure it's taped to the top or wh however they're gonna put it in there. And then go back and say, well, when you check, you gotta make sure that that tray's there. And if it's supposed to have a scalpel, like a disposable scalpel taped to the top, that's what they're checking off every 12 hours on shift checks you know, some way to kind of assure, and then you go through and you show. So they're going to look at, you know, that's the bi-directional flow. Not only do we report that to quality, but we work with other departments. And as you know, in trauma care, all departments, you know, feed into anybody who's doing bedside care is caring for your patients. It's really hard for people to grasp that we're over a patient population, but we're not a department that takes care of them except that we do, but we're at the bedside in the ED, in the OR, on the floor, in the ICU, wherever that patient is, that's where we are. But most people think of um, care, you know, staffing by the department. So anytime you say your trauma, they say, oh, you're in the ED, no. You know, so we have a broader reach than that. And that's part of even looking at the pre-hospital care giving feedback to say, if you've got somebody who's intubated, but it was uh, a bad intubation and uh, they went into, you know, the right main stem bronchus or they didn't hit it at all and they were in the esophagus, we've got to have a way to give them feedback. People make mistakes, but we've got to have a way, you know, to communicate, okay? So this is very important. Now, one of the things I, uh, highlighted for you, and I mentioned a little bit earlier, is at the bottom of the page when it talks about TPM responsibilities, and it talks about, um, I've underlined there, it's near the bottom uh, of the right column. It says the last thing, have oversight of the trauma registry. So for the TPM to have oversight of the trauma registry, you need to understand what the registrars understand. And if you don't have the same education as they do, then you might be trying to manage it incorrectly. So you need to, and this is where we talk about the trauma registry courses. I think it's mandatory, and I, but I'm not writing the standards, that you should take AIS coding at least once just to understand what they're doing. And you need to take that ATS course or that registry oversight course I did that in 2000 and um, I think it was 13. And at that time I had two, uh, two registrars and Crystal is my injury prevention and that was my staffing. We weren't collecting e-codes. We weren't putting yes and no if they were transferred, you know, and the registrars had been, I don't even think they'd been to this course. so. You know, it's kind of, you're thinking, ooh, this is a train wreck. Well, kind of is, but you got to start somewhere, you know, so you have to go through and start educating. But if I had not gone to that course, I wouldn't have known. So um, as um, 
uh, one of the people on my team likes to say a lot, if you expect a certain level of care or review, you've got to inspect. And if I don't know what's supposed to be there, then how am I going to be able to inspect? So you've got to know enough about the registry to help with validation or look at validation results and know that they're good or bad or what about this. Um, so, you know, I cannot emphasize enough. You need to have the education. So not just your registrars, but your PI people, uh, the TPM, I think anybody, and it says here basically, anybody who's in the registry if you look at that trauma registry course and it's uh standard 4.33 and just news alert i'm gonna go over the trauma registry standards um in november when we meet again so just as a reminder we can't get our data better and really know that it truly reflects our care unless it's accurate so garbage in garbage out luckily i've got somebody who's very passionate about data um, accuracy and um, she's our data Nazi, but I don't say that in a bad way. She's really good at what she does. So the second uh, standard we're going to go over is the PIPS plan. Everybody's got to have a PI plan, you know, so you've got to say what you do and how you do it. And this is something that you have to, if you're going to be surveyed, you have to send this in ahead of time. So they have time to read all these documents now. You know, and it used to be that in a day and a half, they don't have time to go through all this stuff and read it. They're going to read it. They really go through it. And like when they look at your charts, they're really going to do it. So I've put stars because I like to put little shapes onto things. And you see my hot pink there. So this is all, um, I'd like to say this is um, in honor of the Barbie movie, but it's not. It's just that I like hot pink because I think it slaps you in the face. So you look at it, but I think the biggies there is making sure that you, um, all these ones I've highlighted, but especially how do you find out about things? So whether it's when you make rounds and go pick up something or talk to somebody, it's that nurse who's getting off the night shift that says, have you heard about blah, blah, blah? You know, those are sometimes the best sources of your data. So, you know, you've got to say, well, when we make, you can say it a little more professionally when you make rounds, but you know, people, when they see you out in the hospital, they're going to talk to you and they're going to tell you what's going on, or you're going to see with your own eyes what is or is not going on. Um, but also the last one outline an annual process for identification of priority areas for PI based on audit filters event reviews and benchmarking reports. So my um, uh, process. I did not follow my PI plan this year for that process because my process, you know, and I say we sit down and we look at it. Well, this year it was because I had a survey, I did this. And so it was my presentation that I had to do about TQIP, which is really about PI. You know, how are we compared with other hospitals? How are we compared with what you want to see? What is the ideal and what's really happening? So you identify that gap, and when the gap is really bad or really wide, then that's going to be a priority. So we went through in my TQIP presentation to the surveyors. At the end, this says, our PI priorities for this year will be, you know, based on what I've just told them about, okay? So that's something that you have to do annually, and it's kind of a, uh, a little bit of a pain, but at the same time, it gives you direction. So you need to do that. Now, it doesn't have to be just for one year because a lot of things are not a one year fix. So whether you're going on calendar year, fiscal year, whatever that might be, I can tell you the priorities we have for this year probably are gonna be two year priorities, but we will go back and look at the beginning of next year or the end of this year and say, where are we on these things? And do we need to keep it as a priority or not? And then move on. So things change. Um, I want to make sure that you see the other thing I'm, I'm working on, which is new and not a fun thing to do, but I'm trying to create a PI dictionary. And so that's something that's come out in different um, articles and stuff. So the thing that I started with is basically the resources on the right of page two, where it says all these audit filters, 
These are all the things you got to look at, okay? So I've got all those things in there. And then I've got things that we look at because we've had a problem with them in the past. You know, so things we've added. So really what I've, I've got this list, but basically I'm looking at what are the filters that we use or the things we use in our PI outcomes module the most. You know, you've got some basic core stuff they want you to look at, you got this list. Then go through the rest of the standards where they talk about non-surgical admits where they talk about triage to the highest level or attending arrival time, all of these things. We look at a lot of stuff and you gotta get them listed in your PI plan. So in the back of my PI plan for about five or six years, we've had this and it always amazes me when I look at it, it makes me tired. And I'm so glad there's a team that looks at it. I've got um, some ever ready battery bunnies, PI bunnies that look at this stuff. You know, it's a lot of things, but you get to where if you're going to do a review, you look and you say, ooh, the doctor was late on this, but I'm really looking at it because of um, MTP, but I can look at it. Was it under and over triaged? Did the doctor get there on time? Did we have a delayed diagnosis or did we just plain miss a diagnosis? You know, so you've got all these things in your head and you're kind of looking at everything at once, which is overwhelming, but that comes with experience. You start thinking about that. But I'm somebody that when I write something down, I remember it better. So that's why sometimes on these new standards, I'm writing down or outlining what they mean, because that way I've kind of put it up here, which is a scary thought because things kind of slip out a lot, but I put them in there and that helps me remember what I've got to look at. Um, and really that's the only two things I've got. Does anybody, um, uh, have any comments or want to share anything about um, the um, the PI plan or the PIPS program? Um, if you're having trouble, we've got a lot of people, none of us do it perfectly. We've all got different ways we do it. And there's good examples from everybody. Um, my first PI plan that I did, I called a couple of people and I said, can I have a copy of your PI plan? And then I just kind of picked and chose you know, what applies to us. And so it's morphed over the years and it's changed. And last year we got a total or, yeah, last year, the beginning of this year, we got a total rewrite because I'm trying to write for the new standards and for a survey <laughs> and make sure I don't leave anything out. So, um, you know, if you looked at part of my plan, some of it's gonna look like Jesse's plan. Some of it's gonna look like Regina's plan. Some of it might look like somebody else's plan. But that's okay, you know, they've done the lifting already, so that's why it's great to collaborate. Never hurts to ask. Um, so it's just, it helps you build a roadmap of what you do. And even though it is a pain to list all those audit filters, it helps you remember the things that you need to be looking at. So we even have where every time we use the backup call schedule, we put it in the registry so that way when they say something about it, we can say, oh, we've got one. But, you know, inevitably they're going to say, well, have you had to use it? Why? Yes. And here it is, you know, but then maybe we haven't, you know, so but you can say it's an audit filter and we do look for that and we do look that they're coming back. That's why they know that you're cognizant of all these things they want you to look at. Questions, comments? Can, can you come speak up here for our friends at home or in their offices? Thank you, Heather. So um, the many years ago, the foundation, we had started to keep some documents on there yes. where people were sharing and then, which I totally agree because I reach out all the time to many of you in the room to ask to share. But I'm just wondering if that's something that we could get back to as well, if we could have that repository so that we have those information there readily available for people to pull. I know we've talked about this before recently, and I just can't remember. I think I've talked to Cheryl and to Gabby about it, but I'm not sure if we ever came up with anything. No, and there's still stuff in there in the, the on the foundation site, you know, down there where you can log in. But that was I think two, 
Yeah. It um, was all pre-COVID. Kendra, can we add that like to the TPM toolkit, you know, as like having a link and then, yeah, and then if you'll help me remember and we'll work it out to either update, I think there was some concerns about um, protection of documents or something like that. And I remember this conversation, Cheryl, but again, because I have all these audit filters in my head, I can't remember the rest of the conversation. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. And all those documents are from prior. Yeah, they're so pretty old. They're like 2019 or older. Yeah. So, um, and it, you can help me remember to kind of say, remember you said this? Did you have a comment, Jesse? Oh. Mm. Yeah, we'll we'll do that. Oh, we um. Yeah. Um. Thanks, Heather. That's a great suggestion. We'll update my stuff. He's going that way. Yeah. Yeah. He's going over to those sweeter people over there. Anybody else? Um have questions and please feel free to reach out to you know any of the people that you've met because sometimes um you know i've like i'm updating uh job descriptions right now and i brought several that are printed out and um because my job description is 10 years old <laughs> but um looking at that and trying to update it um it's always good to be able to look at somebody else's uh stuff and get fresh eyes on that so Any other comments? I think we're probably going to have the bug on Instagram. <laughs> okay, well, finishing a little early and on time. An example for the GTC committee. We can challenge them to that. Um, and uh, you can tell the big dog that I said that. No. Um, but thank you for. Um, attending today and can I get a motion to adjourn move to adjourn okay thank you second it okay so we got Kelly and Karen and we're adjourned thank you for attending <laughs>